Now time for a question period. The member from Oxford. Mr. Speaker, I rise to seek unanimous consent. Given that Life Saving Bill 77 has been introduced five times, passed second reading three times, and has been through committee, I seek unanimous consent on an act to amend the Fire Protection and Prevention Act 1970, 1997 to provide safety requirements related to the presence of unsafe levels of carbon dioxide on premises. Now be ordered for second and third reading, and the question put immediately without further debate, Mr. Speaker. Great. I'm going to assume that that was not the the part the question period for question period, and that it was a unanimous con it was a point of order seeking unanimous consent. Um, so I won't stand down any questions. Uh, the uh, member from Oxford is seeking unanimous consent for second and third reading of his bill. Uh, do I do we have an agreement? Agree? Agreed. I heard a no. Thank you. It is. Given, uh, given my earlier comment, I would ask the clock to be reset, please. It is now time for question period. The member from Nipissing. Mr. Hawkins, I'm so terribly sorry that, uh, that you uh, had to witness that this morning. Premier, on September 25th, the day after the first documents were released, I spent 20 minutes showing this legislature that pages were missing. Nothing from the Premier, barely anything from the Energy Minister. Thanks. The leader of the NDP spoke next and added, quote, there's no correspondence from the Premier's office, followed by, quote, there's a surprising lack of correspondence from the Energy Minister. At one point that day, Premier, you stood up and injected to your House Leader's comments with, and they have the documents. You were a sitting Cabinet Minister at the time. You told fellow legislators, legislators that we had all the documents. It's right here in the Hansard, Speaker, 24th to 25th of September. Will you apologize to this legislature for telling us one thing when you Question. knew all along that it was false? Yes, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have, I believe the uh, the member opposite knows very well that I have gone before committee. I have answered all the questions that were asked of me, Mr. Speaker. And I have said from the moment that I came into this job that I was going to be working to provide all the information that had been asked for. Because, Mr. Speaker, I was clear that there was there was uh, information that had been asked for that had not been provided, and that has now happened, Mr. Speaker. That's why I asked the uh, uh, Auditor General to look at Oak, the Oakville situation, Mr. Speaker. That's why we worked to broaden the mandate of the committee so that all of the questions that were being asked could get answers and that all the documents would be turned over, Mr. Speaker. That's what we've been engaged in for the past number of months. Thank you, Supplementary. Speaker, for quite some time, the Premier, you've been getting away with saying, quote, we have all the documents. And in, in fact, you would not answer all the questions at the uh, Justice Committee. It took the Privacy Commissioner to prove what we've been saying all along. Quote, there was a culture of avoiding the creation of written documentation on the gas plant issue. Quote, so now you're still carrying that on by using secret Gmail accounts to circumvent the laws of this legislature. Premier, is there anything you won't do to keep the the, your gas plant scandal from the taxpayers? Last week, I asked you, I stood here and asked you to call in the OPP to investigate this theft. You would not do that, so we had to. We need you to come clean, Premier. Will you now direct your staff to Question. fully cooperate with the OPP investigation, and will you demand that the stolen documents and USB drives be turned over to the police? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I have said, uh, we will cooperate with whatever questions are asked of us. We have done, Mr. Speaker. And if the, the member opposite remembers, the requests last year were for energy documents only, Mr. Speaker. That has been broadened, and all of the documents that have been asked for, including 130,000 documents that we have turned over, 30,000 documents from my office, Mr. Speaker, have been turned over. Order. The Privacy Commissioner has made recommendation, recommendations. She has written a report. I have said that I agree with her conclusions, that there are changes that need to be made, Mr. Speaker, and we are working with the Privacy Commissioner's office as we speak, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member from Cambridge, final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has no problem taking her staff to the woodshed for spaghetti strapped 
tops, but can't be bothered to ask them to return stolen property. The Privacy Commissioner says deleted documents wiped clean from computers may still exist on USB drives. This is stolen property. Staffers and ministers of the Crown continue to obfuscate in committee. And they say, I don't know anything until you can prove otherwise, Mr. Speaker. That's completely unacceptable. Premier, when will Ontarians finally get some honesty from your scandal-plagued government? So, Mr. Speaker, let me just say, in every aspect of this job, I am working to make sure that we have the professionalism that is required and expected of us as government, here, here. Mr. Speaker. And I will say to the member opposite. I will say to the member opposite, the Privacy Commissioner has written a report. She has made recommendations. I agree with her conclusions that there need to be changes. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, we have proactively taken steps to put in place a protocol that is different than was here before, Mr. Speaker. We have put training in place. We made sure that staff understand that the retention of documents is important and which documents have to be retained. We will continue to work with the Privacy Commissioner, Mr. Speaker, to make the changes that she has recommended. Thank you. No questions. The member from Cambridge. Mr. Speaker, the Privacy Commissioner has tabled a report in this legislature called Deleting Accountability. This now is the label of the Liberal Party and speaks to the culture of the Liberal Party. That's right. But this all started, Mr. Speaker, back in the Estimates Committee on May 16th of last year when we asked for the production of documents. It's been a year, two premiers equally complicit in this scandal. You've lost an energy minister. You've lost a premier. You took forever to apologize, all the while the leader of the third party gasses up your getaway car. You weren't willing to hand over documents a year ago when we asked. We all know how that turned out. Premier, will you now hand over those stolen documents on USB? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, I'll just, I'll just go over what has happened, Mr. Speaker. I came into this office. I said that, I said during the leadership, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to provide as much information as we were asked for. We were going to work to open up the process. That's what I've done. I asked the Auditor General on my own accord, Mr. Speaker, to look at the Oakville situation. We immediately called the House back. We expanded the scope of the committee, Mr. Speaker. I appeared at the committee. We have turned over documents. We put in place a different protocol, Mr. Speaker, around retention of documents. I am doing everything I can to make sure that every question that is asked gets an answer and all the documents that are relevant that have been asked for are turned over. We will continue to behave in that manner, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, Premier, on Friday, Ontarians were shown exactly how far that this government has sunk. In spite of evidence that senior Liberals had broken the law, you refused to call in the OPP, so the Ontario PCs wrote the OPP Commissioner Chris Lewis to get to the bottom of the biggest scandal in Ontario's history. In spite of your shallow pleas that you've been trying to be transparent, it's been clear all along that you're more interested in protecting the Liberal party than the people of Ontario. And just because the NDP Liberal Farm Team is willing to support that kind of behaviour doesn't mean that we will in this party. Premier, you resisted bringing in the OPP, but now they're coming after you. Order. How much more evidence of senior hand. Liberals breaking the law has to come, before, come to light Hold before you actually come clean with the people of Ontario? Question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just let me say that I have done everything in my power since I have been in this office to make sure that all of the information was available. And I have said, Mr. Speaker, I have said that the original decision to cite the gas plants where they were cited did not have a good process up front, Mr. Speaker. There should have been a better process in the initial stages so that a different decision could have been made. I have said that repeatedly, Mr. Speaker, and we are working to make sure that this doesn't happen again. On the issue of the document, Mr. Speaker, again, I agree with the conclusions of the Privacy Commissioner that this should not have happened, that the emails should not have been deleted, Mr. Speaker, Order. and we will work with the Privacy Commissioner to ensure that a better protocol is in place going forward and that the changes that need to be made are made. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. We're not interested in hearing about the emails and documents that were turned over. We're more interested in hearing about the questions that you refused to answer in committee. And you didn't answer 32 questions that were put to you by my colleagues. Perhaps you're covering something up. 32 times you didn't have an answer. 
Order. The member will withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. The former Premier, likewise, refused to actually answer questions in the legislature, and on Friday, he insulted the intelligence of Ontarians by pretending that he had no idea what was happening in his office as this scandal unfolded. Premier, senior Liberals have already broken the law, and your appearance at committee has set the example for what the Liberal standard of cooperation is. Question. Is this the kind of cooperation that the Ontario Provincial Police can expect, or will your government obstruct yet another investigation? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I answered under oath at the committee. I answered every question that was asked of me, and I gave the information that I had, Mr. Speaker. I cannot help it if the member opposite didn't like the answers or didn't understand the answers or was looking for a different answer. I gave the answers that were true, Mr. Speaker. I gave the answers with the information that I had, and I will continue to do that whenever I am asked, Mr. Speaker. We will cooperate as questions are asked. We will provide the information that is requested, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Does the Premier believe that ministers of the Crown are responsible for the actions of their staff? Premier. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I absolutely do. Supplementary. Speaker, Craig McClellan, the Chief of Staff to two ministers of Energy, told Ontarians that he routinely erased emails, destroyed all his emails. One of those former energy ministers, the member for Scarborough Centre, still sits in cabinet. Speaker, has the premier asked this minister why his staff were destroying information that belonged to the public? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think that what the uh, privacy commissioner's report has underlined is that there were protocols and practices in place, Mr. Speaker, that need to be changed. That should not have been in place. I have acknowledged that. I have said that I agree with the privacy commissioner that those protocols were not. Not the right ones, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, since we've been in office, there has been a different protocol in place. We will continue to work with the Privacy Commissioner to ensure that the changes that need to be made are made, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, the question was whether or not the Premier had asked her minister, Speaker, about whether he approved the staff destroying records. The former Premier, the member for Ottawa South, sits on the government front bench as well. He's a member of the Liberal caucus that this Premier leads. In fact, she proudly sat in his cabinet. Has the Premier discussed the destruction of records with the member of Ottawa South? And if not, why not, Speaker? Yes, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I have made it very clear to all of the members of my caucus and cabinet what the rules are, how we're going to proceed, what the protocols are, Mr. Speaker. And the minister, the minister of training Order. colleges and universities, appeared before committee, asked, answered the questions that he was asked vis-a-vis -vis his time as Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. So he's Member been there North and Thumbling answered Thumbling. those questions. He and all of the members of my caucus and cabinet know what the rules are, Mr. Speaker, and we will be following those protocols. And again, I say I agree with the conclusions of the Privacy Commissioner that the uh, retention of information is very important and that there are Member changes that Stormont need to be made. To we are working with Answer. her office, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Speaker, my next party. question is to the Premier. As the Premier knows, a sitting member can actually decline to testify before a committee. New Democrats are asking that the member for Ottawa South come to the Justice Committee to testify about why his staff were destroying information that belongs to Ontarians. Will the Premier ensure that this member of her Liberal caucus comes and testifies at committee? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I know there are a number of people who have been asked to come before or come again before the committee. I can't speak to the scheduling issues that any of those people would have, Mr. Speaker, but I certainly encourage anyone who is asked to come and speak to the committee that they do that, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. A couple of conversations going on between parties. Please stop. 
Speaker, the member for Ottawa South seems to be blaming his staff for the destruction of information that belongs to the public. I think Ontarians want to know why the member himself isn't taking any responsibility. Does the Premier think it's acceptable, Speaker, for this member of her caucus to try to avoid responsibility and blame everything on staff? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, that none of the members who have been called are avoiding anything. The, uh, the member for Ottawa South has appeared before the committee, Mr. Speaker, and as I say, there are a number of people who have been asked to come or come again to the committee. I don't know what their scheduling issues are, Mr. Speaker, but I certainly encourage them to do so to come forward. Final supplementary. Speaker, ever since the Liberals first made their cynical play to cancel private power deals in Mississauga and Oakville, they've scrambled to cover the facts. But no matter how hard they try, the picture is becoming clearer and clearer by the day. We're seeing a lot of finger pointing and a lot of blaming. That'll do. Allow the question to be put. Leader. We're seeing a lot of finger pointing and a lot of blame on that side of the house, but the puck sorry, the buck stops with the Premier, the leader of the Liberal Party. Is she, she gonna keep playing the blame game, Speaker, pointing fingers at staff who have departed, or is she gonna take the necessary steps needed to get the answers that people deserve? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. With all due respect, I believe I have taken responsibility. Here, here. I believe I have said, Mr. Speaker, that those original decisions were not made in a context that was appropriate, that there should have been a better process, Mr. Speaker. I will remind the leader of the third party that, once again, we all agreed in this House that those decisions to cite those gas plants were not the right decisions and that they should be changed, and we all said that that should happen. We implemented the decision, Mr. Speaker. We made that move. But I have said repeatedly, and I have said that it was unacceptable that we didn't have a better process up front, Mr. Speaker. So I take responsibility. And further, Mr. Speaker, in terms of providing the information, as I say, we have done everything possible since I've been in this office to provide the information that has been asked for. We will continue to do so. Thank you. New question, the member from Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Premier. Premier, so far you have shown a complete lack of leadership on your government's scandalous handling of the gas plant cancellations. For months you've continued to insist that all of the documents have been released, even after our party revealed that there were huge gaps in that disclosure. We now know that at least five senior Liberal staff had their correspondence illegally wiped clean. And how have you responded? Well, okay, we got caught this time. We'll have to be more careful the next time. No one will be forced to resign. If you have your way, there will be no consequences whatsoever. The PC party was forced to call in the OPP after you refused. Will you at least instruct your staff to disclose Question. exactly when it went, what went on in your office and to fully cooperate with the OPP Thank investigation? You. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let me remind the honourable member about the leadership that the Premier has taken on this file. When she assumed the office as Premier, one of her first actions was to ask the Auditor General to look into the Oakville situation, and we expect his report later this summer. It was this Premier, Mr. Speaker, who offered, although rejected, a select committee to the opposition, and instead, when they decided to go on a witch hunt over a former member, it was this Premier that offered to widen the scope of the committee, and in fact, again, Mr. Speaker, although rejected by the opposition, to do a government-wide search for documents. In total, Mr. Speaker, to date, we have given the committee some 130,000 documents, including 30,000 documents from the Premier's office, the Premier herself. The member from uh, Renfrew asked the question. I'm sure he wants to hear the answer. And the member from Prince Edward Hastings, if you're in your seat, I would say be quiet, so now I'm going to say it anyway. Wrap up, please. The Premier herself has appeared in front of the committee and asked so every single question. Other ministers have gone forward. Mr. Speaker, this Premier Thank has you. shown incredible leadership on this file. Thank you, supplementary. Member. Back to the Premier. Let's put this into context. 
a sitting president of the United States was forced to resign, and senior staff went to prison when caught in a clear attempt to eliminate records and deny access to the truth. You'll remember Watergate. That's exactly Order. the situation we have here, Speaker. An attempt by the Ontario Liberal Party to the not deny the people of Ontario access to the truth. And at least $600 million of their money is gone. And how does the Premier respond? Well, she's implementing a summer dress code. Uh -oh. While the Premier worries about violations of her dress code, the people of Ontario are more worried about violations of the criminal code in your office. <laughs> Will you finally come clean? Instruct your staff to reveal exactly what went on in your office when sure. these two gas plants were cancelled and fully cooperate with any OPP investigation. Thank you. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I know, I know that the, uh, the, the official opposition is taking advice from Republican strategists, but you know, I think maybe we should put this in a bit of context, Mr. Speaker. We are talking about a decision to cancel gas plants that was supported by every party in this House. Order. And I also remember all members, remind all rem members that you uh, re reference someone by their title or by their writing. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about a decision that was aggressively supported by the party opposite, although they're not interested in answering any questions about that. And the fact of the matter is, as I outlined, Mr. Speaker, when the Premier assumed her role, she was the one who asked the Auditor General to look at the Oakville situation. She is the one who has broadened the scope of the committee and provided it with witnesses herself, other senior ministers, and 130,000 documents. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. For resident quality inspections at long term care homes. I feel like I'm having a really bad case of deja vu all over again because the same minister made the same announcement in 2010. Speaker, all of last week, this minister denied that she had failed. Today, will the minister finally admit? that she has ignored her own legislation. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And uh, to be clear, Speaker, we have met the legislated requirements to have an inspection in long term care homes every year, but we have not met the uh, commitment we made to residents of long term care to do a thorough resident quality inspection every year. Speaker, today I renewed our commitment to that. I announced that we will be hiring about 100 more inspectors. That more than doubles the number of inspectors because we think residents of long term care deserve to have the confidence that they are receiving the highest quality standards of care in our long-term care homes, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, last week, the minister argued with my leader that the inspections were being done. We're talking about a huge credibility deficit here, Mr. Speaker. Today, she gives herself a new deadline to do the resident quality inspection because she failed to meet the last deadline. Can the minister give me and every other Ontarians who want our long-term care home to be safe, a reason why we should believe her this time at her word. Minister. Speaker, uh, in, in 2010, we passed legislation that significantly strengthens our long-term care homes, the quality of care in those homes, including more rigorous inspection. Uh, speaker, I think it's fair to say that as we have implemented this new regime of inspection, uh, we were not appropriately staffed. We needed more inspectors, and that's why I am so very pleased that today I announced that we are making that investment. Speaker, as I said earlier, we owe it to the residents of long-term care to ensure that they have those inspections that will lead to higher quality care. Thank you. Your question, the member from Vendor and Prospect Russell. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Many Ontarians have loved ones in long-term care homes. Their safety and the quality of their care is the, of utmost importance to all of Ontarians. The Ministry of Health plays an important role in ensuring long-term care homes provide the quality of care our patients and grandparents deserve. Our parents and grandparents deserve. Given the recent news, many in my riding are concerned. About 
that the ministry could be doing more inspections of long-term care homes. What is the minister doing to address these concerns? Minister. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Glengarry Prescott, Russell, for this question and for his strong advocacy for seniors in his riding and across the province. Speaker, in 2010, we passed strong legislation setting very high quality standards. In fact, I'm unaware of any jurisdiction that has higher standards than right here in Ontario. It includes a rigorous inspection regime, a regime speaker, but there is more that we need to do. And I acknowledge that, Speaker, and I was very pleased this morning to renew that commitment to the residents of long-term care homes and their loved ones that we will do a proactive, unannounced resident quality inspection annually, Speaker. We will, uh, by the end of 2014, we will have completed a new baseline RQI for every home in this province Answer. and annually thereafter. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. This is good news for all of us who have loved ones in long-term care. Comprehensive, unannounced inspections are important to ensure long-term care homes are protecting their residents and providing a high standard of care. But I'm sure there's more to be done, Speaker. Could the Minister speak about what else she's doing to ensure residents of long-term care homes are getting the best possible care? Thanks a lot. Minister. Speaker, we've come a long way to improve care and ensure safety for our loved ones in long-term care homes. We've got more than 10,000 more uh, people working in long-term care homes. Our 2010 legislation means that long-term care homes must report critical incidents. Inspection reports are posted online. Residence First Speaker is a wonderful quality improvement initiative, uh, provides long-term care home staff with the knowledge and skills they need to provide safer, more effective and more responsive care. Very innovative and successful work is being done through Behavioural Supports Ontario to help staff care for people with behavioural challenges, very often dementia, and we're working to implement the recommendations of the Long-Term Care Task Force. Speaker, there is a change of culture in our long-term care homes. It is very positive, Answer. and I'm glad today we were able to further strengthen oversight in our long-term care homes. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. To quote Sir Walter Scott, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Last week, the government learned that they cannot deceive the Privacy Commissioner. Soon they will find that they cannot deceive the Ontario Provincial Police. The Premier would have us believe that she wants to restore transparency and provide access to all documents relating to the Oakville and Mississauga gas plant scandal. She's made that statement repeatedly, even though she knew full well the damning emails had been erased. What is the Premier prepared to do to ensure that all current or former Liberal caucus and staffers fully comply with the OPP investigation? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, although all the world is a stage, it seems to me that this place, Mr. Speaker, is a place where we are not really engaged in theatre. And what I have said over and over again, Mr. Speaker, is that I have worked since I, the day I got into this office to make sure that every question that was asked, every document that was asked for, Mr. Speaker, received an answer and the document was provided. Mr. Speaker, we opened up the process. We made sure that the committee had the opportunity to ask a broad range of questions and mr. speaker we have complied and provided that information to the committee since I came into this office mr. speaker and I I said during the leadership that that was exactly what we were going to, to do that's what we followed through well, on the member from we will Renfrew continue come to, to order. in that manner mr. speaker um, the idea of asking somebody to come to order doesn't mean that you get to finish the sentence it means you just stop and I also want to um, make a comment on what I heard. There's a delicate balance between what one wants to say in this place and what uh, we're not supposed to say in this place. So I think that you, if you start down the road of leaving the listener with the impression that something is happening unparliamentary in your language, that could be the case. So I'm going to caution all of us to try to avoid trying to say something you're not supposed to say and say it in a way that you can say it. So I'll leave it at that and let everybody just kind of digest that. Supplementary, please. 
Back to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. As this House winds up its spring session, the pungent stench of scandal permeates this chamber. The Liberals and their NDP enablers will soon return to their ridings, and they'll discover that the people of Ontario have rendered their verdict. The Liberal members comprise the Government of Ontario. They are all responsible. And by propping them up, the NDP are now culpable as well. The Liberals have been found in contempt of this House. The Privacy Commissioner says they broke the law. The OPP have begun their investigation. It's time for this government to go. Will they call our non-confidence motion for debate and a vote before this House adjourns for the summer? Mr. Speaker. We have a committee of the legislature which is looking into this matter. The Premier has outlined the steps that she has taken beyond that, including speaking with the Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, the report of the Information and Privacy Commissioner raised some troubling issues, and the Premier has outlined the steps that we have taken Fire to make sale. sure Sir. that the rules as they exist are being properly adhered to by staff, political staff, both in her office and across Queen's Park. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, as I indicated last week, I will soon be sitting down with the Information and Privacy Commissioner to work with her in my capacity as Minister of Government Services to see what steps can be taken to strengthen the act going forward so that uh, the information that she relayed in her report never Sir. happens again. Mr. Speaker, we have been taking proactive steps. We will continue to take those steps Thank and we you. will also allow the committee of this Thank legislature to do Thank you. It. New question? The member from Toronto Danforth. Speaker, Speaker, to the Premier. The former Premier's Chief of Staff, Principal Secretary and Energy Advisor had their email accounts destroyed shortly after the Standing Committee on Justice began asking for documents about the gas plants. Who gave the order for this information to be destroyed? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, again, as I have said, we have changed the protocol in uh, our office. There has been a training done, Mr. Speaker. And, and again, the uh, the uh, member is uh, asking a question that needs to be asked of someone else, Mr. Speaker. It's very clear that we have put in place a protocol that emphasizes the importance of retention of documents. As I say, a training has been put in place. And as the House Leader uh, reinforced, Mr. Speaker, he will be meeting with the, uh, with the Privacy Commissioner in his role as Minister of Government Services so that we can make sure that whatever strengthening of the protocol needs to be in place is done, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Speaker, I believe the Premier has some responsibilities of her own to ask questions. It was one of your caucus members, the member for Ottawa South, who was in your seat when information was being deleted from government computers. The member for Ottawa South is a member of your caucus. Has the Premier asked him whether he gave the order to destroy information? Premier. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, as I said, as I've said previously, the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities appeared before a committee to answer questions about his uh, his time as Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. According to the protocol in place at the time, the email accounts of former government employees were deleted by IT staff periodically after the employee left. That protocol applied to all public servants, Mr. Speaker, so that the chief administrative officer in each ministry approved the destruction of former employee email accounts with the understanding that staff members have appropriately dealt with the records. But that protocol has changed, Mr. Speaker. We have changed that protocol. Since February, we've taken steps to make sure that political staff are aware of their responsibilities. Uh, there's been mandatory training put in place, as I've said, so we have changed Answer. the protocols around the retention of information. Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question. The member from Ottawa, Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, over the past number of years, we have made tremendous gains in our education system. Our graduation rates have increased by 15 percentage points. Our test scores have grown by 16 percentage points. Excellent. McKinsey and Company has rated our schools among the best in the English-speaking world. As we continue to roll out full-day kindergarten, we are providing our youngest learners with the best possible start to help them succeed later in their education. But if we're going to continue to provide our students with the skills they need to succeed, we need to ensure that our teachers are well-trained for the classroom of today. 
I understand that our government has made improvements to our teacher education program. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Education, could the Minister please inform this House on what our government is doing to enhance our teacher education programs in our post-secondary institutions? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa, Orleans, for his continuing interest in education. Speaker, we know that for student achievement to improve, we need to continue to provide our students with high-quality teachers, and that's why we are improving the way we train our teachers for the classroom. Our new enhanced teacher education program will increase learning time for prospective teachers from two semesters to four. It will also double the amount of practical teaching days from 40 to 80 days, and students in the program will gain experience in areas including special education, mental health, and incorporating technology into the classroom. Speaker, we also know that we do have an oversupply of teachers in our province. As a result, we will be reducing our admission rates for the program by 50 percent so our teachers will have a better chance of being employed once they graduate. By making sure our teachers are Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. For informing the House about the work our government is doing to provide our teachers with the skills they need to teach in our classrooms. It is great to hear that Ontario is modernizing teacher education to provide our students with the best possible education. Minister, I expect these changes could impact some post-secondary institution teacher education programs more than others. It could also impact resources that have been going, on, uh, going to other programs within universities. Can the minister inform the House about what the government is doing to ensure adequate funding for Ontario's post-secondary teacher education system? Minister. Colleges and universities. The Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our post secondary partners have done a tremendous job adjusting to the challenges they faced in the past. And, and I agree, I, we're calling on them again to be challenged and to adjust to some changes, and, I, and I'm quite confident that they can do it. They'll need to move very quickly to adjust to this new curriculum to implement it by 2015. This will be a, a ch challenging for them, but, Mr. Speaker, I'm confident that they'll do it. Uh, well, they'll also need to adjust to the decision to lower the funding assignment for teacher ed seats. This won't be easy, Mr. Speaker, but I'm pleased to report that we'll be working closely uh, with impacted universities and we'll work with those severely impacted to help them through this period of adjustment. Mr. Speaker, together we will continue to build on the work that this government has done to make Ontario yes, a global leader in education, and we'll be working with those stakeholders to ensure that that work continues. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. New question, a member from Simcoe North. To the Premier. The Auditor General and now the Privacy Commissioner have provided scathing condemnation on the behaviour of your government and the government that you are now responsible for. My question is simple. In each of the cases where those officers of the Assembly have in great detail enumerated your wrongdoings, you have thanked them for their advice. Wow. How many more scandals before you finally take decisive action on their advice? When will you show some leadership? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I I do thank the officers of the legislature for their report. They work hard, Mr. Speaker, and they perform a very, very vital and important function. And so that is why I have said thank you to them. And I have said in this most recent instance, the, uh, the Privacy Commissioner, I agree with her conclusions. There are changes that need to be made, Mr. Speaker. And I think if we ex if we accept that somehow, at some point, there will be a static and perfect state of all of the processes around the legislature, then I think we're mistaken, Mr. Speaker. The, the legislature and the processes continue to evolve. That's why it's important to have the officers of the legislature analyzing what's happening and giving us recommendations. So I do thank them. I agree with the conclusions of the Privacy Commissioner, Mr. Speaker. And in every case, we have either sure. begun to take action before the report has come out, Mr. Speaker, which which is in the case of the Privacy Commissioner, or we're responding to recommendations in, a pro in an active way. Thank you. Well, the NDP party has chosen to prop up the Wynn Horwath government with the promise of a new financial officer, another voice responsible to the Assembly. Are you going to thank him when he admonishes you, or are you going to provide real leadership and exercise some ministerial responsibility? Thank you. 
interesting, Mr. Speaker, because underlying the member's question is some kind of assumption that if everything were perfect, you wouldn't need to have these officers in place. The point is, Mr. Speaker, that it's important to have it's important to have objective eyes looking at the procedures, looking at the processes, looking at government, and providing advice. That is the point, Mr. Speaker. So, of course, when the new financial accountability office. Thank you. Premier? When the new officer is in place, Mr. Speaker, we will work with him or her. We'll make sure that we provide the information and that we that we provide whatever information is necessary so that that officer can do the work that will then lead to productive recommendations. That is the point of having objective analysis of the actions of a government, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to Thank working you. with that person as we have worked with the other officers of the legislature. Thank you. New question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, Windsor residents are concerned about a toxic powder called petroleum coke that's been piled three stories high, occupying an entire city block just across the river from Windsor. Pet coke has been called dirtier than the dirtiest fuel. Residents, tourists, commercial and sport fishermen on both sides of the river are concerned about clouds of black dust blowing off the mounds that are left uncovered. The Premier has known that Windsor residents and officials have been concerned about these open piles for some time, so why didn't the Premier bring up pet coke at the recent meetings of Great Lakes Governors? Minister of the Environment. Premier, Minister of the Environment. Uh, these matters are always uh, raised with the appropriate authorities. The member would know that the uh, Government of Ontario has been very concerned about this and is taking all the action that would be appropriate. We are. Uh, concerned when particularly items of this kind uh, arise, when the uh, Americans are involved with it. These matters are raised from time to time, uh, from the ministry staff to ministry staff. In our case, it would be the Ministry of the Environment, and Environment Canada, in fact, would be involved as well. And in the uh, state of Michigan, I believe it would be called the Department of Natural Resources of the state of Michigan would be involved in this. So these matters have been raised. I thank the member for uh, raising it in the House because it gives it even more of a profile now, and I think the need for the appropriate action to be taken by uh, those who are responsible is quite evident uh, to all who are concerned. Thank you, supplementary. Speaker, I appreciate the minister's concern, but uh, the, the government's silence on this has been deafening. Windsor residents know that wind and rain don't know borders, and they are concerned about what's going on to happen, uh, what's going to happen to the river uh, Windsor shares with Detroit when rainwater and mountains of pet coke, which is high in sulfur and high in heavy metals, runs off into the river. Windsor Council, the local MP, Order. and Michigan state and federal elected officials have all raised concerns about the potential health and environmental danger of pet coke piles, but the Ontario government has been silent. If the Premier has known that residents and local leaders uh, have been concerned about the pet coke, then why hasn't she taken any action to help resolve this problem? Minister of the Environment. I, I think the, the information is uh, not accurate that the member has provided, and it's not his fault. He wouldn't be aware of the fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, that officials of the Ministry of the Environment have contacted their counterparts in Environment Canada as this is an international situation that has arisen. Environment Canada and the International Joint Commission are the lead on this issue, and we have offered to provide, as a ministry, we have offered to provide any assistance required to see this issue resolved. So, in fact, we are working with Environment Canada on this issue, it being international. The International Joint Commission is involved in this issue at the present time. And our ministry has uh, raised this issue. The member perhaps gave the impression this has not happened, but our ministry has, in fact, raised this issue Answer. with all the appropriate authorities. We hope to see it resolved as quickly and expeditiously as possible because we find the situation that exists to be unsatisfactory. Thank you. New question, the member from Oakland, is Markham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Many people are increasingly choosing to rent out their basement suite as an apartment. Whether the suite becomes a home to an elderly parent, a spot for a live-in caregiver, or an apartment that will provide additional income to help the family with the mortgage, these spaces provide families with the flexibility they need. 
However, if these secondary suites are poorly designed, they can be quite dangerous, especially if they lack fire alarms, proper exits, or adequate fire barriers. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what our government has done about these issues and how they will help assist Ontarians in finding practical housing options while ensuring the safety of all Ontarians? Thank you, thank you Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for the question. Uh, our government understands that uh, the residents of Ontario need flexible and affordable housing options, particularly as our population grows up and ages. Secondary suites such as basement apartments and granny flats provide an affordable housing option and a solution to our increasing population, our changing demographics and our aging communities. These spaces allow Ontarians to have a place for their elderly parents or extended families to live with them while allowing for independency and privacy. It also gives elderly homeowners the ability to have their caregivers live with them, extending the time that they're able to stay in their homes. And these suites, whether they are newly built or have existed for years, must meet building and fire codes, providing safer housing options for Ontarians. Answer. These are the solutions that Ontarians want and deserve, and that's why our government made changes to the Planning Act to help increase the supply of this flexible housing. Two supplementary. Thank you, Minister. It's very heartening to hear what our government is doing to increase the number of affordable housing units in the province. But all of these additional suites could provide additional problems. In some communities, residents have expressed concerns about the impact of secondary suites on their neighbourhoods. They are worried that the increases in population will lead to increased demand on services such as schools, hospitals, public transit and even roads. This need for additional housing options needs to be balanced with the capacity of the municipal infrastructure that exists. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you tell us what consultation occurred with municipalities before we implemented these changes? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and again, I'd like to thank the uh, member for the question. As a former city councillor myself, I remember how in the past the relationship between the municipal, the municipal government and the province was fraught with tension and mistrust. That's why, since 2003, I and this entire government has worked very hard to repair the relationship we have with municipalities. In fact, we signed an historic Memorandum of Understanding with the Association of Municipalities in 2010, endorsing the principle of regular consultation. And on the issue of secondary suites, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing met with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and the City of Toronto to work together before changes were made because we know that these changes would have an impact on municipalities. Our government remains committed to continue to work with our municipal partners in making these changes yes, to help communities across Ontario address the local housing issues in a way that respects local opinions and desires. Thank you. Thank Speaker. you. Your question? The member from Barrie. I didn't know is literally becoming a cliché coined by the McGuinty win Liberals. The Liberals didn't know how much the gas plant ca cancellations would cost taxpayers. The Liberals didn't know about thousands and thousands of files you see and document dump after document. Order, please. Thank you. Member from Barrie. I guess I hit a nerve, Mr. Speaker. And apparently the Liberals didn't know that staffers were instructed to use Gmail accounts and delete email records free from public scrutiny. Speaker, there are only a few explanations for not knowing. Ignorance, incompetence, or moral bankruptcy. Premier, which one is it, or is it all the above? All the above. Here, here. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it is this Premier that, upon assuming office, asked the Auditor General to look into the Oakville situation. It is this Premier, Mr. Speaker, who proposed the Select Committee of the Legislature to look into the gas plant situation, which was rejected by the opposition. But she still went ahead and talked about modifying, enlarging the role of the committee, which uh, was agreed to by the committee. It was this premier who appeared in front of the committee, and it's been under this premier's watch that 130,000 documents have come forward. Yes, Mr. Speaker, there is uh, material in the Information and Privacy Commissioner's report which needs to be responded to, and this premier has given me direction as Minister of Government Services that we work with her to see that the current rules are strengthened, Mr. Speaker, so that. We the, uh, the actions that she outlined never happen again. Answer. Mr. Speaker, this Premier has shown leadership in this regard in making sure that uh, there is transparency when it comes to the gas plant issue, which I remind the member Thank again, you. his colleagues were out campaigning for in the most recent election. Thank you. Supplementary. Right. 
Thank you, Speaker. I, I mean, the ridiculousness of this it doesn't even stop. I mean, it's easy to open up the process. It's easy to show leadership after you've destroyed all the evidence that comes before it. Unfortunately, incompetence and malfeasance are not mutually exclusive, Speaker. In fact, the Liberals have demonstrated the two are actually complementary to one another. Last week marked the first time ever that an Ontario government has been investigated for two separate scandals by the OPP. The Ontario's Information and Privacy Commissioner concluded records were in, record laws were in fact broken. The OPP's elite anti-racket squad have launched a probe into the latest scandal within a scandal the destruction of information on the public record, and it seems that just about everyone's ethics barometer, everyone's ethic barometer is going off the scale, except for the McGuinty, Win, Horvath government. Oh, Premier, the people of Ontario kind of got stuck with you, really. When you let, will you let Ontarians decide if the Liberals Thank are too you. incompetent or too corrupt to lead Ontario? Thank you. Government House Leader. Been 130,000 pages of documents that have been put forward to the committee. But let's go back to first principles, Mr. Speaker. In the last election, the last election, Mr. Speaker, there was not one party that promised to cancel that gas plant, Mr. Speaker. There were three parties that promised to cancel that gas plant. It was the leader of that member's party who went on YouTube and said that if he was elected premier, it would be done, done, done. It was the leader. It was the leader of that member's party who went before committee, Mr. Speaker, and 28 times refused to talk about the costing and the research that had been undertaken by his party. Mr. Speaker, it was the leader of his party who has been encouraging candidates to not appear in front of the committee to talk about their role in the gas plant cancellation. Mr. Speaker, I am very proud of our Premier, yes, who has been forthcoming in terms of the action she has taken and appearing in front of committee. It would like to it'd be nice to see the same from that party across the way. Question. The member from Timiskimi, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Slap suits are on the rise in Ontario. These lawsuits are commonly used to intimidate people from participating in public debate. They are an affront to democracy. Last week, the Attorney General introduced legislation in this House that is intended to curb this problem. If passed, it would fast track these type of lawsuits so they would be heard within 60 days and dismissed if they were shown to be slapped. Speaker, it's been much more than 60 days since the boards of the Mixed Group of Health Services and the Anson General Hospital in Iroquois Falls have served nine members of the community with defamation lawsuits for standing up for what they believe. Oh, no. oh. Minister, do you support the anti slap legislation proposed by your government? And if so, why is your ministry still funding lawsuits against the people of Iroquois Falls? Oh. Oh. Uh, speaker, thank you, and uh, uh, I, uh, I welcome the member's advocacy for uh, the hospitals in his community, and he and I have spoken on several occasions, and as he knows, uh, we are moving forward with uh, uh, Mr. Rongagnon is in there uh, trying to uh, do what he can do to get uh, the health care that uh, the people deserve in that community. Uh, so, Speaker, we will continue to work on this, and of course, I fully support the uh, the legislation that was introduced by the Attorney General just last week. Supplementary. Once again, to the Minister of Health, the Lynn has initiated a review of the hospital situation in Iroquois Falls. Your ministry has also appointed a special investigator to look at the governance of the Anson General Hospital, and still these people are being sued. People in the community are very concerned about the future of their hospital, and as a result, when the hospital board announced that it was reopening memberships to the local corporation, interest was understandably very high. Imagine the community's surprise and outrage when over 200 people have had their membership applications refused, including long-term volunteers and past members. Wow. Minister, can you tell me why Mrs. Gilda Shea, a pillar of the community and a recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, is not welcome as a member of the Anson General Hospital. Wow. Speaker to the Minister of uh, Community uh, Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm replacing the AG today. 
So one of the great things about living in a fair and democratic society is that we can speak out on matters that are important to us. If passed, this legislation would protect citizens by allowing courts to quickly identify and deal with strategic lawsuits, including a fast-track review process, we need which requires that a request to dismiss must be heard by the court within 60 days. We have worked hard to develop a proposal that balances the protection of public participation and freedom of expression Pass with the protection of reputation and economic interest. Yes, this legislation provides a major Ontario solution based on the consensus recommendation of an expert advisory panel and extensive stakeholder consultation to provide a faster, more efficient civil process. Thank you. New question, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, this question is for the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. Minister, social entrepreneurship is a sustainable way to build a diverse and a vibrant economy with opportunities for people of all abilities and backgrounds. The 2013-14 Ontario budget includes a strong plan to help people across the province, including the promotion of new and innovative business initiatives. In my reading of it, one of the key initiatives is promoting entrepreneurship and innovation, providing Ontario the ability to transform ideas into goods and services to compete in the global economy. This is especially important for businesses owned by women and young people, and particularly by new graduates. Would the minister update this House on what Question. the province is doing to assist social entrepreneurship? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. And thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Mississauga Streetsville as well for this question. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are global leaders when it comes to social enterprise. There are roughly 10,000 social enterprises currently operating in this province. And for those who might not know what social enterprises are, they are both for-profit and not-for-profit entities that focus on pressing social issues and have as their aim community well-being. To continue Continue our commitment, Mr. Speaker, of supporting social enterprise in this province. Last month, we announced $600,000 in support for a new catapult microloan fund, a partnership between the Centre for Social Innovation and a large group of private sector stakeholders. And this investment is going to help kickstart promising social enterprises, with funding opportunities, and mentorship services. Uh, this collaboration between government, businesses, and not-for-profits is the first of its kind. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Minister. Minister, young entrepreneurs, women, and those new to Canada need those partnerships to be able to foster social enterprise in Ontario. Social entrepreneurs need access to the right funding opportunities. In fact, as we both know, there's no, uh, 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 no more fatal weakness for a new business than undercapitalization. It's important that prosperous and fair societies can depend on a sustainable economy. Minister, please tell the House how pairing economic development and social impact will create economic and employment opportunities for young Ontarians. Minister. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, the Ontario government is focused on building both a prosperous economy and a fair society for all Ontarians. We believe that these two goals are not only complementary, but they are interdependent. And many social entrepreneurs and innovative thinkers know that you can't have one without the other. Our younger generations are poised to make a difference in the world. That's why the bridge to economic development for so many of them is guided by social impact for many young Ontarians. Our government's mandate reflects this kind of social responsibility. We've committed $295 million for our youth job strategy. Mr. Speaker, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that of the 50,600 jobs created last month in this province, I'm proud to say that more than 20,000 of those jobs are jobs for, under youth, for, for youth under the, year, under the age of 25 years of age, Excellent. dropping the unemployment rate by 1.1 yes, for those same youth. Your new question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, on May 16th, my private member's resolution to establish a select committee to develop a comprehensive developmental services strategy was unanimously accepted in this legislature. 
Yet, this committee has yet to be struck, and there's every indication that both the Liberals and the third party are balking at this, despite the unanimous consent. Premier, this is of huge importance to people across this province. They are counting on us to help them. Will you stand up today and agree, right here, right now, to establish this committee so they can start its work immediately? Please. 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 Speaker, I, I, I certainly speak uh, uh, for members on this side of the House that we appreciated the motion that was brought forward and the members' commitment to uh, issues around developmental services. I think the honourable member is aware that uh, that motion, uh, the follow-up to that motion, is a matter that uh, is discussed between House leaders, and there is a process to examine those types of requests and move forward. And Mr. Speaker, I would advise her obviously to uh, work with her House leader, but certainly myself and uh, the other House leaders will be meeting hopefully later today. And the member from Renfrew will come to order. That's the last time I'm telling her. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, as I say, there is a process to uh, examine these requests. Thank you, supplementary. Speaker, with the greatest of respect to the House Leader, that is complete and utter nonsense. This is not a partisan issue. This is not something that should be caught up with other House Leaders' issues. This is vitally important to people, and you know, and I know, everyone in this House knows, those people desperately need our help. Do not do this. Please agree to strike this committee. And we have spoken to the House Leader. This is nonsense. Do the right thing and establish this committee right now. Please. 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 Thank you. Government House Leader. Speaker, as a former as a former Minister of Community and Social Services, I can talk about our government's commitment to the developmental services sector. And I can talk about the significant investments that have been made by this government. And Mr. Speaker, I can talk about our most recent budget. The member for Prince Trevor Hastings come to order now. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, I can talk about our most recent budget and the investment of, I believe, $42 million additional dollars in the developmental services sector, a vote which is going to happen, Answer. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow afternoon. When it comes to special committees of this legislature, Mr. Speaker, there is a process where House leaders take a look at those. New question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Minister, you will know, because I've talked to you on a number of occasions about this issue, the docks in Moussigny have been taken out of the river and have been sold by the, by the town of Moussigny. As a result of that, People have absolutely no way of being able to transfer from the water taxis onto the Moosini side of the river safely. I've talked to you about the possibility of the province taking over the responsibility to maintain those docks in an ongoing way, and I would like to know if you can have your assurance now, because the Municipal Council is meeting tonight, and they need to know from you if we're able to do this. If so, I think we can work this out. Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure Transportation. I, I Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite for his very hard work on this file. I'm in total agreement. I, uh, we are trying to find money right now in the ministry. As you know, budget is tight. This is not a, a huge amount of money, but it's important. Uh, any action by the uh, town council uh, to support this process, to uh, get the docks, uh, which we have to retrieve, uh, and to work with my ministry to do that would be most helpful. So I would strongly encourage them uh, uh, to support the initiative that you have been advocating. Sir, thank thank you. you. Point of order from the Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'll just indulge the House. I'd like to introduce my mother, who is here, Pat Wynn, and my youngest sister, Marie Hodgson, and her friend, Brenda Fry. Thank you. The member from Toronto, Danforth.
The member from Toronto Danforth on a point of order. Uh, yes, Speaker. On point of order, I need to correct the record. Earlier today, I asked a question of the Premier. I referred to the Justice Committee when I should have referred to Estimates Committee. Thank you. The member is uh, right with his point of order. All members have the right to correct their own record. Minister of Education, a point of order. On a point of order. This seems to be mother morning. Uh, the mother of my chief of staff is here today, and I would like to welcome Rosario Goristi. Oh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.